Welcome. So what does make you think that the solar system is warming up? This is a reprise of the lecture I gave to the Hampshire Astronomical Group a couple of weeks ago, talking about the idea that the solar system is warming and thus disproving that global warming is caused by greenhouse gases. I promised all my friends on YouTube that I would try to recreate this lecture and so this is by way of an experiment, so feedback would be much appreciated. It's often claimed in the media that the whole solar system is warming. In fact, if you Google that phrase, you get 88,000 hits. However, if you Google the phrase evidence for solar system warming, you get three hits. However, the argument goes on to say that the only common feature between all of the planets is the sun. Thus, the sun must be putting out more energy. So if the Sun is putting out more energy, global warming is due to the Sun, not greenhouse gases, QED. Now this is a very appealing and simple argument. The purpose of today's talk is to look at the premise, and to see what evidence is presented to say that the solar system is indeed warming. But let's pause for a little while and take a look at the other three sections to this argument and see whether they hold any water. So the second line says, if so, the only common feature is the Sun. Well, that isn't strictly true. There are other common features like the interplanetary medium and cosmic rays and things of that sort. But it is true that the Sun is the most likely cause of changes in planetary temperatures. So we'll leave that one for now. Thus, the Sun must be putting out more energy. Now, this is rather a strange one that you conclude that the Sun is putting out more energy from measuring the temperature of the planets, when we can actually measure the temperature of the Sun and the energy output of the Sun right by itself. And when we do that, we find that the Sun really hasn't changed its energy output very much. If anything, it seems to have dropped rather than increased over the last 30 years. But even if that were not the case, that would not prove that all of the global warming that we're seeing on the Earth is due to the Sun. You'd merely be left with arguing what proportion of its greenhouse gases, what proportion it is the Sun, and what proportion are other factors. So this whole argument doesn't hold together scientifically at all. But the hypothesis that the whole solar system is warming as a result of the solar activity is very, very hard to prove scientifically. First of all, you'd have to show that all the planets were warming on the same time scale as that of the Earth. Then you'd have to show that all the bodies in the solar system are warming, and there are over 300 of them, if you include planets, moons, asteroids, and planetoids, and that they are warming in an appropriate way. And that would require detailed climatological models of each planet, which we don't have, and a long enough climate record to determine any climate trends, rather than just changes in, effectively, weather. This plot shows the temperature anomaly for the Earth for the last 160 years. For the first 60 or so years, the plot is relatively flat, with just normal natural variability. Then there's a short period of warming, and then from 1940 to about 1980, another flat period, again with some natural variability involved. However, from then to the current time, there's been a steady rise in global temperatures. And so this is the sort of plot that would have to be matched by the other planets. However, we don't have very good observations of the other planets before the space age. So our data really stretches from the mid-60s up until the present day. And so most of what we're trying to match is that steady rise in global temperatures. For a given change in solar output, each planet is going to react differently. They have different atmospheres, in both in density and composition. Some planets have magnetic fields, where others do not. The albedo, size and distance from the Sun of these planets change. The Earth has oceans, which act as a thermal sink and evens out the changes in solar input. And the inclination of the spin axis is important, because that's what creates the seasons. So let's take a look and see how three of these factors play against one another in determining how much energy a planet receives per unit area and the total energy that a planet receives. The amount of energy that the planet absorbs is inversely proportional to the albedo. So the higher the albedo, i.e. the more energy that the planet reflects, the less energy it will absorb. Also, from the inverse square law, the distance from the Sun affects the amount of energy that a planet will get. If you want to get the total energy that a planet will absorb, you have to take the size of the planet into account, and it's the area that the planet will present to the Sun. So we'll just assume for the moment that all the planets are nice spheres, and so that will mean that you have to bring in the radius of the planet into the equation. Now on the basis of just these three parameters, let's compare the planets and see how different they are. Here's a table showing that comparison. Mercury being closer to the Sun gets far more energy per unit area. In fact, it gets 238 times more energy than the Earth does per square meter. However, being a tiny planet, it only gets a total of three and a half times the amount of energy that the Earth does. 
Venus and Earth are for all intents and purposes twins. Mars, being both further away and smaller, gets both less energy per unit area and less total energy. Jupiter is a long way away and only gets 3% of the energy that the Earth does per unit area, but because it's a huge planet, overall it gets 3 and a third times more energy than we do, remarkably similar to Mercury. Saturn, Uranus and Neptune being yet further away get much much less energy than, uh, per unit area than any of the other planets and correspondingly relatively small amounts of total energy. The Greeks had a very refreshing way of doing science. They sat around and thought about it. And perhaps we don't do enough of that. So let's pretend we're Greeks for a time and do a thought experiment. So first thing you've got to do is empty all the money out of your pockets and throw it away. So that will make us feel a lot more like Greeks. And the thought experiment is that we're going to take the solar system as it is now, but we're going to put a perfectly stable sun in the middle. I.e. there's no solar cycle, no sunspots, no flares, no plage, nothing that to change the output of the sun. It would be emitting the exact same amount of energy all the time in perpetuity. Then we'll let the solar system evolve as it is now and come to equilibrium. Now the question we're going to pose ourselves is, at any given time, under these circumstances, how many planets would be warming, how many of them would be cooling, and how many of them would have stable temperatures? So given this situation, with a stable sun and the planets in equilibrium, how many of you think that all the planets would be warming? Okay, how many of you think that all the planets would be cooling? So I assume the rest of you must think that all the planets would have stable temperatures. And that indeed is a very logical conclusion to come to given the circumstances. However, I bet you I can change your conclusion with just one word. Anybody can guess what that word is? Yes, that's right. Eccentricity. The planet's orbits are not circles, they are ovals, or ellipses to be precise. And so that means that a planet is closer to the sun at perihelion and further away from the sun at aphelion. So a planet will spend half of its time getting closer to the sun and half of its time moving further away from the sun. Thus, if all other things were equal, we'd expect half the planets to be warming and half the planets to be cooling. In fact, the Earth gets 9% more energy at perihelion than it does at aphelion. And some of the other planets have much more eccentric orbits than the Earth. But all other things aren't equal. There are other factors to take into account. For example, the tilt of the planet's spin axis. That causes seasons. And some seasons on some of the planets are very, very long indeed, causing uneven heating of the planet. Also, the day-night cycle can cause a difference. Not for rapidly rotating planets like the Earth, some days on some of the planets are very long indeed. This also means that the changes in the Sun must be significantly larger than any of these effects. Otherwise they'd be swamped by them. I'm going to divide the talk into three parts. The introduction, which is the part you've just heard. Part two will be about the inner solar system, Mercury, Venus, the Moon and Mars. Part three will be about the gas giants and the overall conclusions of the talk. For the rest of the talk I'm going to examine the premise that the whole of the solar system is warming. What I've done here with considerable detective work is to try to trace back each time somebody claims this and to see what they base it on. In each case I'll give you the evidence that I have found that claims that each of these particular planets is warming and then see whether that evidence actually is scientifically valid and whether it means that the planet is warming globally or not whether it's warming on the same time scale as the Earth or not, or whether even it makes scientific sense. If anyone knows of any other claims of why these planets are warming, please send them to me as a private message, and I'll try to include them in future talks. I'll be bringing out part two as soon as I can, but until then, that's it for today. Keep safe. Bye for now. <laughs>